fundamentally a, a couple of things, and that's one of the things is can we uh, trust the Bible? Number two, we want to uh, at some level discuss whether or not uh, black people can really be Christian or whether or not uh, there is a different persuasion that black people should pursue. And uh, overall, and just maybe just overall uh, the role of religion in the, in the life of, uh, of African American people. And so uh, we have two very distinguished gentlemen here today that will uh, help us facilitate this discussion. I'm going to ask them to uh, introduce themselves, talk about their background a little bit, and uh, talk about a little bit about their belief. And if you got, if you just gentlemen can take like five minutes to do that, we'll be fine. We'll start with the Moray. My name is uh, Moray Alicia Israel. Moray means teacher in Hebrew. And I'm a teacher of the House of Israel uh, in Cincinnati, as well as a representative of the Most High all over the world. And I teach that uh, the plight of the black man in America is not a strange or trivial or insignificant act that had escaped the all-seeing eyes of the Most High. But I teach that everything that has ever happened to us, everything that is happening to us, and everything that will ever happen to us as a people have been prophesied in the Bible. I teach that the Almighty has a chosen people who are known as the House of Israel. And we are the descendants of those people you read about in the Bible. When Moses told Pharaoh to let my people go, he was speaking of our people, the original House of Israel. So I teach that we are a people that have been prophesied and everything that is pertaining to us is recorded in the Holy Scripture. And I also teach that everything that you have learned in your churches is false. You have never learned the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about anything at all. I teach the greatest word that only be found in one book, and that book is called the Holy Scriptures, or the so-called Old Testament of the Bible. And I teach that this book has our whole history in it. I teach that the New Testament is a total contradiction against the words of the Most High. And not only does the New Testament contradict the Most High, I teach that the New Testament contradicts itself. And it cannot be considered a book if one is seeking to learn more about their creator. And these are just a few of the things that we teach in the House of Israel. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Reverend Greg Draper. I'm from uh, Columbus, Ohio. I've been pastoring the uh, last 20 years, um, the last several at Concord Missionary Baptist Church. Um, I do teach and believe in uh, Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that he was crucified, died, buried, and resurrected on Sunday morning. I've been uh, blessed to uh, travel around the world, Jerusalem, Israel, Palestine, some of the things that I've been allowed to do. I do uh, disagree with Moray uh, in relationship that New Testament is the unfallible word of God from Genesis to Revelation, that the Bible is in its essence uh, true. Uh, we receive it by faith. Uh, we believe that our faith is a symbol of, and a declaration of what Jesus Christ has sacrificed on Calvary, that he did die, that he did suffer, and that he is soon to return, that he is sitting on the right hand of our Father. So we've come today to uh, share an intellectual discussion, to share with the scriptures, uh, not to be critical, but to have enlightenment so that we can go on in our own personal journeys to uh, uh, come to some conclusion on what our own faith says and what our faith not only says, but our faith should move us to action. That not only should we be able to look at it critically and analyze it and make decisions, but we should also be able to take our faith to another level and put our faith into action. So that's why I come to share the second time this year. Yes. 
Okay. Um, you know, typically when you get people together of various theological persuasions, there are some small differences. We have, it, it appears to be some major differences. So let me ask them a right. Why, tell, you said that what we've been taught in our churches is false. Tell us why we cannot trust the New Testament. You cannot trust the New Testament because it's a total contradiction against the words of the Most High. In the Old Testament, the Creator says He's the only Savior. According to the New Testament, Christ is a Savior. According to the Old Testament, the Creator said His chosen people are the house of Israel. According to the New Testament, there's no difference between a Jew and a Greek. They're all one under Christ. According to the Old Testament, the Creator established a covenant called circumcision. According to the New Testament, Paul said circumcision profits nothing. According to the Old Testament, the Creator says you have to keep His laws. He said His laws is there, are your life and the length of your days. According to the New Testament, Paul said the laws are done away with. According to the Old Testament, uh, according to the New Testament, a woman is not even allowed to speak in a church. No preaching church. According to the New Testament, any woman speaking in a church is considered a shame. According to the Old Testament, we had many women prophecies and women judges. According to the New Testament, you can eat anything, rat, dog, pig, uh, mouse, anything. According to the Holy Scriptures, Old Testament, the Almighty gave us a dietary law, and He told us not to eat anything unclean at all. So, whatever you look in any category, it's a contradiction. According to the Old Testament, the Creator says that David is the Messiah that will come and rule this earth with Him. According to the New Testament, Christ is the Messiah. According to the Old Testament, the Creator says that he that find it a wife, find it a good thing, and attain it favor of Yahweh. According to the New Testament, if a man is not married, he's not to seek a wife. He's told not even to seek a wife if he's not married. So these are just a few of the many, many contradictions against the Creator's words. So but how do you ascribe, when you say the Creator's word, we got one book, the Holy Bible. How do you ascribe authority over the New Testament versus the Old Testament? Because this, in, in, this, in the same way that you put forth your theological perspective, as a, as a Christian scholar, we'll put forth and say, Jesus said this. And we find authority in the words of Jesus, in the words of the Apostle Paul, the same way you find authority in the words of Moses, in the words of Isaiah, in the words of Jeremiah. And I, and I, and I, and I think that the, the, the real difference is this, and that is, is that Moses died. Jeremiah died. Jesus died, and on the third day rose again, according to our Bible. And and I know this is a discussion that you and I have had before. You say, well, he, he's just a dead man. He's rotting in his grave. But, but wouldn't that be the biggest scandal in the history of the church if you could prove somehow that this man named Jesus actually did not rise from the grave? So tell me, how are you ascribing authority in the Old Testament and saying that that's greater than authority in the New Testament? First of all, in the Old Testament, the Creator speaks. The Most High speaks. You read words in the Old Testament that says, Thus said Yahweh, but thus said the Lord. Or the word of God came unto me, or the word of Elohim came unto me. In the New Testament, you will never see where the Creator spoke at all. The Creator never said one mumbling word in the New Testament to anyone at any time. And the Almighty never contradicts Himself. The New Testament is a book that men are quoting, and these men contradict especially Paul. He not only contradicts what Yahweh said, he contradicts what Christ said. So we cannot use the New Testament as a book of any highly spiritual authority. It has no validity and no spiritual authenticity at all. 
Jesus said that I came to uh, fulfill the law, not to destroy it. That the Old Testament is not to be done away with, but that the Old Testament and the New Testament, they are married to one another. And you can't have the old without the new. Now the new, it, what it does, the Old Testament, what it does from a theological perspective is it reveals Christ. Prophecies, <coughs> all of the things that are foretelling, telling about the birth of Christ, when Christ would come, how Christ would come, how the whole uh, narrative of, of the passion scene is descriptive in the Old Testament. So Jesus comes back and he says to the disciples, he says, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill the law. And that what the law did in its essence was that the law showed us where we were wrong, but it was judgmental in the sense that it had the power to forgive us of our sins. But Jesus says, not only am I going to show you what was wrong in the Old Testament, but he says, but in the New Testament, what we see a new picture of is we see Christ not only showing us what is wrong, but showing us what is forgiveness, what is love, what is all those things that take place in the New Testament. So you, you, in my opinion, in my theological discovery, it is that you cannot take the, you cannot have the Old Testament without the New, nor can you have the Old without two, because it fulfills each other. They are all connected one to another. Well, he said you can't take, have the Old Testament without the New. If you go to any Jewish synagogue, you won't see a book called the New Testament. There never have been such a book. The only place you'll find a New Testament is in the Gentile churches that was started by the Gentiles. No Jewish synagogue deal with the New Testament because it's never part of their book. No black Israelite deals with the New Testament that has any knowledge of who he is because it's not part of our book. My dearly beloved brother said that you can't have one without the other. He said that Christ said he came to fulfill the law, law not to do away with it. Well, Christ didn't come to do away with the law then why are you worshiping on Sunday? There's no one in the Bible that ever worshiped on Sunday. Christ didn't worship on Sunday. Paul didn't worship on Sunday. As a matter of fact, no one worshiped on Sunday. This is something else that was set up by Catholicism that's not even in the Bible. You say that Christ said he came to fulfill the law. What did Christ do away with the circumcision? According to the New Testament, Paul said circumcision Prophets, nothing. If, if Christ did not do away with the law, then why did people that go and observe the New Testament eat swine and eat pigs? Because the New Testament tells them so. No, Christ did not come to do away with the law, and that's how you know that Christians are not following Christ. They're following Paul. The Christ of the New Testament, no Christians are following because Christ said, you must keep my father's commandments. No Christian church on this earth is perpetuating and going by the commandments of the Most High. None. Christ did. I, I would dare say that there's no Israelite, no Jew, no Muslim, no anybody that can follow the law. Because when you talk about the law, you're talking about the first five books of the Bible. It says, for example, if a man has a fade haircut, cuts the hair away from his temple. You gotta be stoned to death. If you curse your parents, stoned them to death. Nobody is, it can follow the law. That's the purpose of having the New Testament. Now, let me ask this. You probably drive a car. You probably have a cell phone. These are evolutions in technology. Just as the Old Testament is a foundational book, the New Testament represents an evolution of, of theology, of, uh, a continued revelation of who God is in the world. And so the one thing that, that I think that nobody has ever been able to refute, and that is, is, is the nature and the person of who Jesus is. And we have documentation through all the New Testament of his divine attributes and his divine acts. So how can you take a man who, who is reported by more than one of the scholars in the New Testament that raised the dead, that healed sick people, and say that this person was not, not, was not divine in nature, and the more so said that they were a fraud. First of all, he made a statement that no one can keep the law. And the law said if someone uh, do something, they would be stoned to death. That's, that's now what was that statement, that very first Shave statement? Your Shave your head, you would be stoned to death. That's not in the law. 
the only time they stone someone to death, according to the law, is for committing a capital punishment. There were many sins and infractions of the law, and they were punished, but not by death. The only death sentence were those such as witchcraft, adultery, idolatry, and so on and so forth. So if you had someone so, in your congregation that committed adultery, would you stone them to death? No, I wouldn't. You ain't following the law? Yes, I am. That's the reason I wouldn't stone them to death. First of all, is that there is nowhere in my book that tells me that any time a man walks up to see someone and see a woman making an indiscretion, that he is a stone that woman to death. That's not my law. My law says that if a woman committed adultery, then you bring it to the elders of the city. We're not ruling our own self now. We're not in our land. We're not executing our own laws. So no, we're not in a position to begin to set up capital laws in a strange land. We were sent to this land because of our disobedience to the Creator. But I want to mark the fact that you said that nobody can keep the law. If nobody can keep the law, why is it mentioned all through the Old Testament that there were people that kept the law? Why would the Almighty give us laws that he knew we could not keep and then punish us for breaking laws that he knew that we couldn't keep in the first place? He's not unfair and neither is the creator unjust. He knew that we have the capacity and the ability to keep every commandment in this Bible. The Bible speaks of perfect men on this earth. It said Abraham walked before Yah and was perfect. It said Job was a perfect man. It said Aesop was perfect. So we had many perfect men, and even in the New Testament, there were men that supposed to have lived by the law and the whole law and nothing like but the law, such as Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth. It said they, these people were holy and walked in all of the ordinances of Elohim. So I don't know what Bible you read that says that people could not keep these commandments, for they did, all through the book. And nowhere in the Bible, though, it said that Christ was perfect, but it did say that there were many perfect men. But he wasn't mentioned as one of them, not out of the mouth of the Most High. And he did name several men that were perfect. And none of them was Christ. When Jesus was baptized, the Bible says that the heavens opened up and the voice of God said, this is my son and who I am well pleased. One of uh, the theological things that we have to take into consideration is the uh, duration, time, and context. Uh, Dr. Evans talked about different cultures, different times, uh, living uh, the law now. But as we look at the law, can we live that law today? Is that relevant to where we are right now in our own journey. And then when we see Christ coming in, uh, we see him coming in in the sense of grace and mercy. Because everyone, even though you maybe, maybe you had people in the Old Testament who could live the law, but what about those people who did not live by the law, who violated the law? What happens to them? So if, if they are violators of the law, then there has to be some means by which reconciliation takes place. So reconciliation takes place through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sin, and uh, giving, forgiving people of their sins. So that's the connection between the Old Testament and the New. Here you have Adam in the Old Testament who creates the first sin that falls, and then you have the New Adam in the New Testament that comes and becomes that redemption for us who sets and, 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 and redeems us from those sins that occur in the Old Testament with the first Adam and his disobedience, but now we see the Christ coming, and there has to be transition to connect between the Old Testament and the Old and the New Testament. Because if we were still living under the law, I don't think that many of us would be able to live by it. And that's not justify us. Jesus said, "Let us not sin, that grace may abound." But there are many things. Even all of us in here tonight uh, have to deal with the issues. Could we live under that law without the grace and the mercy and the dispensation of grace without Jesus Christ? I want to I ask Maria a question. Oh, man, come in on what he said first. My friend said that uh, he heard the voice of God came there is nowhere in the New Testament. I repeat, there is nowhere in the New Testament where Yahweh ever spoke to anyone at any time that is not recorded so. And then he said that we don't have to keep the law 
all we have to do be, is to be forgiven of our sins by Christ. We strive. There was, please, sir. We strive. Sir. A man once asked, once asked Christ, how can you have eternal life? When the man asked Christ, how do you have eternal life? The man, Christ did not tell a man to believe in me. He didn't tell the man to start speaking in tongues. He didn't tell the man to go be baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of your sins. The man asked Christ, what can I do to have eternal life? Christ turned around and told him, keep my father's commandments. Matthew 19, 16. Now why would he tell a man to keep his commandments for eternal life if in fact he knew that he's not capable of doing so? And all the man had to do is believe in him. Nowhere did Christ say that all he had to do is believe in me and you shall be saved. Because if you believed in his words, you would be keeping his father's commandments. Christ said that he would rebuke all the, the Christians that claim that they believe in him and are not keeping his good father's commandments. According to Matthews, the seventh chapter, 21st verse, Christ is alleged to have said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my father, which is in heaven. He said, for many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not healed in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? And in your name have we not done many wonderful works? He said, all professing to them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. But why didn't he know? Because they never learned how to do the will of his Father, which is in heaven. According to the Revelation, the last book in the New Testament, the book of prophecy, it says nobody will get into the golden city except those people that keep the Father's commandments. It's New Testament. You know, what I find to be interesting is that you will use New Testament to prove a point, but when it goes against something opposite of what you say, for example, at the baptism of Jesus when it says, the, the heavens open up and say, this is my son, I'm, I'm well pleased, you say, well, that didn't happen, or we don't accept that. But when it fits your point, you say, okay, I'm gonna use it to make my point. But when it doesn't go against your point, then you discredit it. And I just, and I just, and, I, and, and, here, and here's what we call, here's what we call that in, in, in critical thinking and logic, it's a fallacy. It's a very, very bad argument. And it's the same reason why Minister Louis Farrakhan lacks credibility among a lot of people because he'll preach from the New Testament when it fits his point. But when it doesn't fit his persuasion, then he discredits it. And I mean, even when you go back to the Old Testament and you talk about what it says, thus says the Lord or, or God said this, that, that's just a narrative. It's, it's a writing pattern. And any scholar that has studied the, 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 the Old or New Testament understands that those are writing patterns that the, that the writers use to declaim divine authority. It has, it has, in itself, it has no authority. It's a writing pattern. So my, my point to you is that I just, I think it's really, really a bad argument to, attempt, to say, okay, here's something the New Testament says that, that fits my perspective, and so I'm gonna use it. But when something doesn't fit my perspective, I'm gonna discredit it. And that's not what, Somebody like me who's, been, who's, who's trained in theology, that's not systematic theology. There's no consistent system of theology there. And that, and that means it really lacks credibility. Sir, I was not using the New Testament to discredit it. I was using the New Testament to discredit you. And you, I was showing you what Christ said about you have to keep the commandments. So as a matter of fact, it's you all that keep discrediting the New Testament. Because nowhere does the New Testament perpetuate Sunday worship. Nowhere did Christ say, all you have to do is uh, believe in me to be saved. Nowhere did Christ tell people that they did not have to keep his Father's commandments. Nowhere did Christ do away with the laws on the Sabbath day. So what I'm doing is use, using your book to show you that you really don't accept it. You really don't go by it. 
What, 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 did he say to, what did he say to the rich? What did he say to the rich young ruler when he comes in and says, "What must I do to inherit eternal life?" He says, "You know the commandments, the laws." And he, this, what did he say after that? He says, "Then deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow after me." Right? Not, not exactly. The man asked him, "What can he do to have eternal life?" And he told him to keep the commandments. And then he said, "I've done all these things from my youth. What like an I yet?" And he said, if thou will be perfect, that's the statement he said, if thou will be perfect, then take everything you own and sell it and give it to the poor and then follow me. Mm -hmm. But it didn't say that's what you had to do to have eternal life. Uh, that's, that's just bad. That's really, you know, well, that's what the book says. That's, you know what that, that's doing? That's, that's really slicing and dicing to fit your your own narrow perspective. That's like because because there's certain things you don't eat. So that's well. Here's what you're doing. You got a pizza, you got pepperoni on it, and you're you're pulling the pepperoni off and eating the cheese. Guess what? The pepperoni's still baked in it, baby. It's still it's it's still there. Now this is what Jesus said in Matthew five and seven five seventeen says, uh, "Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have come to dest or destroy it not, but I have." Lo, I come to fulfill it. Again, these are Jesus' words. He did not come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill it by living his life and sacrificing and giving his life up for us as sinners. There was no other way for reconciliation to take place without the blood of Jesus Christ. If that's so, then why did the Father say in the book of 2 Chronicles 7, 14, he said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. The Father said in order for us to be reconciled to us, we have to stick, stop living wickedly. You gentlemen want to perpetuate and tell the people that they can't keep the laws, they're not perfect, Nobody perfect, so don't worry about trying to keep these laws. Just believe in Christ, and he'll, for, he'll forgive you. When in fact, Christ said just the opposite. Christ said, you must keep my Father's commandments. And my friend keep reiterating on the fact that the, he said, I come not to destroy the law. If he, not, if he didn't come to destroy the law, then why are you worshiping on Sunday? Sunday is the resurrected Sunday of Jesus. That's why Christians worship on Sunday. Give me some Bible for it. <clears throat> I can give you the Bible. I know you can. But in, in reality, the reality of it is that it's our own personal expression of how we express it. Christianity is based upon personal relationship. It's personal relationship with Christ. It's our own relationship with Christ. And, and therefore, it is not to be judged or uh, anyone to uh, tower over any people, but it's your own personal relationship. And how you work through that whole relationship depends on how uh, your relationship is with Christ. Well, Christ in the book of Matthew 7, 21 says nobody has a personal relationship with him except those that are doing the will of his Father. And you're still giving me excuses. You're saying one reason, one minute, we're supposed to keep the commandments. And then I ask you, why are you breaking them? And why are you teaching people that they are to break them? And you tell me about a personal relationship. I don't think we're breaking them. We said here again, Christ said, we should not sin that grace may abound. We're not sinning with those who we can go do whatever we want to do, live a riotous life, and then go to church on Sunday morning and think everything is all right. You've got to have a conscience in the Holy Spirit, which convicts us of the way that we live, then determines, you know, how we live our lives and how we have our relationship with Christ. You don't live any way and then say, I can live, I can do whatever I want, sin, kill, rob, steal, and then say, I'm going to heaven. Uh, I, I think that there has to be some, some, some relational things between you and Christ where you understand that you can't live any kind of way. You can't do anything you want to do, but you have to answer for the deeds that you do. It is not justification. Christianity does not justify why it's living. Okay, well, I, let's, let's, move, let's, 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 let's move, move in this. a different direction. All right. Because I know that people who have questions. Um, Moray, is God a racist? No, it's not. So you call yourself black Hebrews, black Israelites. Can white people be a, a part of your I don't call myself black Hebrew, black Israelite. The only Israelites in the Bible are black. So I don't have to say I'm a black Israelite. All I have to do is say I'm an Israelite, and anyone with any scriptorial knowledge 
would know that the people of the Bible are black, just as they would know that the people of England are white. They, they were Semites. They, 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 they were Semites. They're, they're, not, they're not black as an African black. They were Semites. The well, the Semites are black. That's, I think that that's, that's interpreted. That's no, that's not. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a <coughs> I mean that's I mean well, they're, 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 not, they're not white. They're, well, wait, I mean, was not, Moses a Semite? Huh? Was Moses a Semite? Uh, Moses a Hebrew. Well, all Hebrews are his Semites, sir. And and Moses was black. Uh, Job said he's black. He was Semite, Hebrew. Uh, Solomon said he's black. Uh, uh, Jeremiah said all the Israelites are black. All of them described as having woolly hair. And most of the Israelites in this Bible wore dreadlocks or locks. And uh, Jerusalem is in Africa. So uh, I don't have to say I'm a black Israelite. Jerusalem I'm an Israelite. Is where? Jerusalem is where? In Africa. Matter of fact, if you were is that, in is Egypt. That geography? Yes, yes. Because, because Matter of fact, is, is Egypt in Africa? Yeah, Egypt. Where you can walk from Egypt to Jerusalem. Okay, but that's They're not on the same good. land mass. What happened, the Caucasians have divided up sections with the Suez Canal, and then they tried to brainwash our people, and then one country on the land mass, they say belong to another continent. That's and it's not another continent, it's on the same land mass. That sounds a lot that sounds a lot like Sarah Palin saying her foreign policy experience is I can see Russia out my back door. Certainly, Jerusalem on any map is not in Africa. On any map, any any student that's even studied basic geography knows that. Well, that, that's, that, that's, in, that's in Palestine. It's a totally different country. Where's and, 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 and here's what here's what I will say to you is, is that Kentucky and Ohio are part of the same land mass. But you go to Kentucky, you can buy liquor there and bring it back to Ohio, or buy cigarettes there. Or and we're connected to Indiana. We're connected by a lot of things. But you know what? There. Geographical divisions there that indicate where one state ends and one, where another begins, and to say and to say that to say that that Jerusalem is in Africa is not only only wrong; it's totally wrong, and it's and it, and it, and it, and it, and it really exposes the fallacious nature of your argument. Well, let me ask you this, sir: What is the geographical landmass that separates Jerusalem from Egypt? It's, 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 a, it's a boundary that's been drawn by, by the inhabitants. The people, the people no, no, it wasn't drawn by the inhabitants. It was drawn by Europeans to brainwash you. So you won't know that you are part of the African history. All of the Israelites were in Africa. It's part of Africa. They drew a landmass for you. That's why I asked you to expose yourself and let the people know what's the geographical landmass that separated them. I, I, I don't see the I don't see the I don't see the Africans fighting to get that land back. I see the Palestinians trying to get it back from the. You're not answering my question. What is the geographical landmass that separate Egypt from Jerusalem? And, and what I what I said to you before is that there in many many instances when where countries border one another, such as the United States and Canada, there's nothing that separates us other than a shack where you go across the border. Okay, and so what I'm saying to you is that. That argument has absolutely no merit whatsoever because the division of the land masses are, de are determined by the people. And, and Jerusalem wait, is wait, clearly by what Jerusalem people? is clearly in another country which is not African. Wait, by what people? You say it's separated and determined by that argument only fit, that argument only fits your narrow theological perspective. Only that's what it does. It fits your narrow theological perspective that God is somehow a racist. And that only black people are the are the true people of God. And I and I got a thing here I put off the internet that, that I found to be very interesting. I pulled this off just today. It says the Southern Poverty Law Center described the black Hebrew Israelite movement as being nothing more than black supremacy. Well, first of all, I'm not gonna let you get off that oven. I've asked you in a very respectful <laughs> and dignified manner to tell me. What geographical landmass that separated Africa from Egypt, and you start attacking me personally? Yes, <laughs> yeah, you did. And then you start attacking the Israelites about something you got off of the internet about what somebody said. I answered your question. I said, you had I said there, is no, there is nothing that separates, there is no landmass that separates the United States from Canada. It's, a, it's what's called a border. And in between 
Africa and Israel, there is a border. That is the, the, the line of division. Parallel. It's something that's, that's, that is established well, by the inhabitants. Maybe you can tell us. It, there's nothing that divides it, but it's It don't divide it because no it's all no the same I, country. I've been there and it's I've all the same land mass. But what the Europeans did, they tried to separate Israel from Africa just as they're trying to separate Egypt from Africa. There are some books that tell you the Egyptians or Gentiles are Caucasian people. And that now you have Europeans that are now posing themselves as Israelites, just as you have Europeans that's posing themselves as South Africans. And now they want to try to put a imaginary line that they created with a canal that they man made and then tell you it's not together. And that's not so. What's but, the land mass that separates the United States but, from Canada? But here, here is What's it called? It's called a border. But here's a, the point. Getting back to our, and these gentlemen and the ladies will be able to do research on what we're talking about. But if you're dealing with spirituality and theology, the New Testament condemns what you're teaching. You keep saying going to church on Sunday. Nobody went to church on Sunday. You got that from Constantine. What you're doing is taking European theology and putting it in the Bible and teaching it to our people. The only day that anybody kept holy in this book is the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week. Christ kept all of the commandments. He taught all of the commandments like all the Israelites doing and the people that are calling themselves Christians today are not teaching the words of Yahweh and they're not even teaching the truth out of the New Testament. Okay, and that's a fact. We have questions. I do. I don't believe in Christ as you do. Uh, the most I can give him to say is he's one of my brothers. Now, is he the son of Yahweh? No, he is not the son, he is a son. The creator has many sons. And this is something that the Christian world is not aware of. But if you look in the book of Exodus, the fourth chapter, and you write it down, Exodus, the fourth chapter, the 22nd and the 23rd verse, you'll see where the Creator identifies His Son as Israel. And it says, Thus said Yahweh, Thus shall you say unto Pharaoh, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Now, if Israel is the Almighty's firstborn son, then how can Christ be His only begotten son? You can't have somebody coming 3,000 years later saying, I'm the only begotten when you got a land full of sons. And Yahweh said, Israel is my son. That would be symbolic Nowhere language. Nowhere did Yahweh say, Christ is my son. That would be symbolic. Nowhere. That would be symbolic. Symbolic language. Symbolism. Well, that's not symbolism. When symbolism. You in the Bible, where it said, that's it, Yahweh. Yeah. That's not symbolism. That's scripture. A country cannot be a son. It cannot be a firstborn son. It's obviously symbolic language. And any, any critical thinker, and anybody that thinks through that, knows that that is symbolic language of a relationship that, that the creator has with a group of people. It's not son as in the sense of having a baby. It's symbolic of relationship. Okay. Go ahead. The verses that you're citing are mostly from the Old Testament. Do you, what do you think of the New Testament? Do you not count that or? Well, if you haven't been in here, I, I generally, I generally quote what thus said Yahweh when I'm establishing the law and when I'm establishing truth. And the Almighty does not speak in the New Testament. 
But if you were in here long enough, you would have noticed I went to the New Testament several times to let my dearly beloved brothers know that they're not teaching what's in the New Testament. Several times I went to the New Testament to show them that the people of the New Testament were making an indictment against them and what they're teaching today, which is not according to what Christ taught. And so oftentimes, you have to know how to establish truth. Truth is the words of the Most High. It's found all over the Old Testament. Now when I go in the New Testament, is any truth there? Yes, it is. And how do I know it? Anytime I read anything in the New Testament that is consistent with the words of the Most High, you know it's the truth. But at the same time, anything in the New Testament that contradicts the words of the Most High is a lie. For instance, you might read the Old Testament where Yahweh say, don't eat no dog. The New Testament say, eat anything. That's a lie. Yah might say you have to keep his commandments. Christ said you have to keep my Father's commandments. That's the truth. Why? Because what Christ said then was consistent with what all the prophets said. <coughs> Go ahead. Speak up, speak up, speak up. He said that Abraham was perfect, and is it the story Abraham wasn't married to uh, Sarah? Uh huh. And then Sarah had, I think, the last. He lied. Time. He, yeah. lied. he told a lie. Yeah, he told a lie. Yeah. It was I a perfect lie. Right, and then. Or probably Abraham, a white lie. Right. Oof. Take that woman with his sister. Yeah, he lied. No one, if you look at the old testament, he lied. I was trying to listen to your question, man. It's good. Okay. I just heard it. Well, no, he didn't lie. She was a sister. He was, he was denying that she was his wife. No, no, no. You said he, he lied, lied about his sister. The only lie that's being told is what you're saying right now. What are you talking about? She was his sister. She's his half-sister. Perfect at talking about figuratively speaking. But in the Old Testament, you look with Enoch, who uh, walked with God. God told these people to be uh, upright, you know. But from that sense, it's more figurative than, I believe, reality. Because Abraham had, I mean, that had a lot of incidents where he was, you know, in some stuff, you know, biblically. Yeah, so he wasn't perfect in the sense of not without sin, but he was perfect in, as it relates to what God had him at that particular point. Uh -huh. uh, the Creator Himself is the only one that can determine who's perfect and who's not perfect. And He called Abraham perfect. Now, that is not to say that He has not did things in His life that was against the law. But once he perfected his heart to walk before Yah and be thou perfect, he was. Just like David created said he was perfect. That's not to say he hadn't did many wrong things earlier in his life. But when it came to him selling his mind to walk with the creator, the creator said that David's heart was always perfect with him. And who am I to call the most high a lie? According to Job, the first chapter, the first verse that said that uh, Job was a perfect man. And who said he was perfect? Yahweh. said Job is a perfect man, upright man, a man that feared Yahweh and eschewed evil. And who called him perfect? The Most High. Now they said Christ was perfect. Who called him perfect? Not the Most High. Because the Most High never mentioned his name nowhere in the New Testament neither in the Old Testament. Earlier my friend was talking about prophecies on Christ in the Old Testament. There is not one prophecy on Christ in this book. He's not even mentioned. His only name is not even mentioned out of the mouth of Yahweh anywhere in the so-called Old Testament period. 
Well, as one the Creator said to us is Messiah, the gentlemen don't want to talk about him. inspiration of God. They wrote as God inspired them. And this is what you get the Old Testament and you get the New Testament married together. Remember you had you had a 400 year silence piece between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it opens up again with the New Testament after the 400 years of silence. So what, what, what you see happening is over this 1500 year period where, there's to, to write, where they're writing the Bible, you see these 40 men who are inspired of God, who have given credit in this particular canon scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. You know, uh, might I add to that young lady? Uh, we had the Holy Scriptures called the Trip Scriptures of Truth, where Yahweh spoke all through the books. That's only in the Old Testament. Centuries later, the people that the Creator told his people to stay away from, which are the Gentiles or the Europeans or the people that he cursed and turned white years later these leopards that he turned white wrote their own book and put it in the Bible. And then they called the Holy Scriptures, they changed the name of it and called it the Bible. And then the Holy Scriptures, they called that the Old Testament. And then their book, they called it the New Testament. Then they taught the world that we're not under the Old Testament no more. We're going by the New Testament. But they had it all in one book. But as I said, any of the ancient manuscripts, you won't even find a New Testament. A Jewish synagogue, you won't find a New Testament. This is a Johnny come lately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what's the, uh, what's, your, what's your name? Draper. Draper. Brother Draper? Yes, sir. Uh, Brother Draper. Yes, sir. Uh, you said earlier uh, that uh, Christ in the New Testament became the means of redemption for not only Christian but for the people of the world. And doesn't Christian theology say that Christ was in the, bo the bosom of the Father from the foundation of the world? Yeah. Then Christ being in the, in the bosom of the Father from the foundation of the world, why would he contradict his Father where his Father says in Deuteronomy that the fathers cannot die for the sins of the children, nor can the children die for the sins of the Father? Why does he contradict that and uh, go against what the Father says? From a theological perspective, Textual particular scripture. When you look at scripture in its context, you have to understand what was happening at that particular time. When you go back to Genesis and God says, In the beginning, let us, when we talk about creating, when we talk about God being in the bosom of the Father at the beginning of the time, He said, Let us make an image, let us make man in our own image. He said, Let there be light. So we see Christ on the creation scene, and we see Christ coming all the way through the 42 generations, ending up in, in Bethlehem. That's, that's, we see that thing happening as the redemptive one who is to save the world of our sins. So in the sense of contextual scripture, what we call, uh, whether it's an exegetical scripture or it's an eisegetical scripture, looking at it from the context, when we look at Jesus, we see him on the creation scene. We see him coming through prophecy, through the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, heading into the New Testament and ending up in Jerusalem and in, 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 in Bethlehem. Let me come in on that same thing. I am always being a bosom of the Father. Uh, 
if Christ was at the bosom of the Father before the foundation of the earth, and if Christ, as you teach, is the only begotten Son of God, who came here to die for the sins of man, then why did he die for the sins of the first men when the world was destroyed with a flood? Why did he come and say, hey, don't destroy this great world with a flood? I come to die for it. You know that. Why did he die for the sins of the first world? The first world was wicked, so man decided to destroy it. Oh, now, agree, but the second <laughs> world is not. It isn't. It's probably more wicked. We're than not wicked, so he's going to die for us, but that one was real. <laughs> now, does that make any sense? He came to die for the sins of the world, but he said he didn't die for the sins of the first world because this gentleman said the first world was wicked. Well, remember, there was a remnant of the first world. That, I mean, you have, you have, after the flood, you have Abraham, so that remnant is still there. But why so he did, we, and, and theologically, he did die for them. He died for he died for Noah and that whole uh, that whole remnant. What that is was it going to be? One minute they did, because no, there were two I'm minutes. The you, next minute I'm, they I'm did. I'm answering your question. I'm saying he did. But die your for contradiction. No, I'm not. I'm saying that he died for that remnant that was saved yet through the Ark of the Covenant. Well, Abraham wasn't part of the remnant, sir. The only ones that were saved is Noah, his three sons, I mean, and their yeah, wives. Yeah, no. And they were saved because, according to the Bible, because of their righteousness. In other words, because of their ability to keep the law. That's the reason they were spared. But everybody else died, and Christ didn't die for their sins. Christ didn't save them because there was no Christ. According to the law of the Creator, as this gentleman said, Deuteronomy, the 24th chapter, the 16th verse, it says, The son cannot die for the sins of the father, neither can the father die for the sins of the son. Every man must die for his own sin. That's Deuteronomy 24, 16. That's what the father said. So if Christ was here, then you're going to have to have, and answer the question, why did he die for their sins? <laughs> Because the only people that were saved were the people that kept God's commandments or Yahweh's commandments. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Incidentally, I, I, I passed out some paper to someone. Would you please get it to our dear little loving brother? And uh, please get one to Professor Rev. Uh, she's going to comment on some literature I passed out to show you that the New Testament had no continuity, no harmony with the original Holy Scriptures at all. I got 16, I got 15 questions that came out of the New Testament. And every one of these questions, the Old Testament says just the opposite. The Creator says just the opposite. Yahweh says just the opposite. And while you're reading that, you was going to ask the question, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> According to the New Testament, is it true that a Christian, if they are not married, then they are never to get married? But in, when I read it, in the Bible it says, Art thou bound to unto a wife? Seek not be loose. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. Can you clarify that? Well, it said, uh, as I state, and what, what question is that? Number 14. Number 14 on the paper, it says, According to Christianity, according to the New Testament, it teaches that if a man don't have a wife, he's not to get a wife. And that's exactly what that says. If you have a wife, seek not to be loose. But if you're loose from a wife, seek not a wife. What is that don't seek a wife? That means don't try to find one. No, but let's see, let's well here now 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 you know, let me say this. It's, now he's in he's in my area now. Because I'm a New Testament scholar trained theologically. I want to see if you're going to contextualize it right. Because I because I know what I know what's going on with the Apostle Paul when he says it. Let's but let's see how I characterize it. Let's go. Well, because he's in my area. Now. <laughs> <laughs> let's, 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 let's let's see if he knows what Paul's talking about. Let's talk. Put it in context. Textual. Come on. Well, all through the book, right? Uh, see, Paul thought he was in the last day. And he was preparing everybody for the last day. And he was saying, uh, in the same chapter, he was saying that if you don't, if, you're, if, if you, you, you are married, don't get a divorce. But if you don't have a wife, don't seek a wife. So 
when men are growing up, they don't have a wife. Teenagers don't have a wife. And when they come in, when they become an age to have one, Paul said, don't seek a wife, which is totally against the Creator's commandments, because the Most High said that he didn't find it a wife, find it a good thing. In the same chapter, in that same chapter, Paul said if you have a daughter that's a virgin, uh, don't let her get married until she is past the flowers of her age, in biblical terms, until she's too old to have babies. Then you let her get married. But the Creator said something totally the opposite. I'm just showing you how backwards this was. Paul was totally contradicting Yahweh as well as Christ. 